We all know that climate change is coming. We'll see enormous change and destruction in our lifetimes, but how do we each respond to this on a personal level without being totally overwhelmed and paralysed by our knowledge of what's coming? After a lifetime of working in personal development in the knowledge of an imminent global environmental meltdown, I have some thoughts about how we can each approach this topic in a way that leaves us capable of acting and responding. And that's what I'll be talking about today. If you find this video helpful and engaging, please remember to give it a like. If you'd like to see more videos about personal development in response to real, current topics, make sure to hit subscribe. It's taken me a long time to shoot this video. I regularly make reference to climate change and imminent threat in my other videos, so if you are a regular on this channel, you'll have heard me talk about emotional resilience, but today I'm finally going to try and tackle this directly. Today I'm going to be speaking about how do we generally respond to the idea of climate change, um, mentally and emotionally, uh, collectively and individually, and what could we do differently? I've got kind of a new approach to climate change uh, on a personal level, um, and which could be a collective response to the imminent threat. So I'm going to be unpacking some of that today. So first of all, let me just explain specifically what I'm talking about. Um, there has been a growing awareness for the last 30, 40 years that uh, the way that our civilization behaves on this planet is causing huge damage. Um, and we focus generally on uh, CO2 production um, and to a lesser extent things like methane and how they are causing a greenhouse effect, uh, global warming, and then more accurately and more generally we use the phrase climate change because as you dump more energy into such a complex and varied system it's not just that we get hotter, um, it's that uh, you get more intense storms, you get a shift in weather patterns, um, you get all sorts of secondary effects happening within the biome, um, and that very complex response is what we call climate change. Um, we're beginning to see the effects of that. Um, every year there seem to be new unprecedented events in terms of uh, major weather um, and uh, you know dust bowls appearing where there weren't any, um, drought or flooding or all sorts of things happening around the world. It seems to be getting more extreme and this tends to kind of match the modelling that's been done. We have a pretty clear picture about where all this is going now. The International Panel on Climate Change reported to the UN a number of times um, with thresholds about kind of how we need to restrict CO2 production and uh, what will happen if we don't at various thresholds, um, sort of a 0.5 degree rise, 1 degree, etc. rise, and then what that will kind of translate to in terms of global impact. Um, but much more generally this is also just the damage that our civilization is doing to the natural world, whether that is ravaging uh, ecosystems, whether that is dumping huge amounts of um, non-biodegradable pollutants into waterways and into the air, um, and dumping it in the ground, um, all sorts of things that our civilization just does as part of our lifestyle. And what's become increasingly uh, apparent and aware to us is that there aren't many people responsible for this. There, there was this big trend for a long time, in the same way that the tobacco industry tried to uh, obfuscate and, and make up a whole bunch of spurious studies and, and try and push responsibility back onto consumers and things like that. The polluters have also done a similar thing, so there was this big drive um, certainly when I was growing up and for the last sort of 20 years or so around personal responsibility. If you recycle, if you travel less, if you use public transport more, you will make a huge difference because you are basically the cause of climate change. And even in all the years that I've been involved in um, activism and environmental awareness, um, that was still kind of a common rhetoric, was that what we need to do is push back onto individuals, um, get them to have a more personal connection with nature and with uh, the damage that's being done, and then they can change their behaviour and we'll start fixing the problem. But we kind of know now that's not how it works. There's a small number of companies, corporations, um, backed up by world governments, who are doing almost all the damage. 
Um, and they're doing it because it generates a huge amount of wealth, it, it, it concentrates power into the hands of the people um, making these decisions, um, it's generally old white men who don't seem to have the same kind of emotional connection with the implications of climate change as Millennials and Gen Z do. And so while personal responsibility continues to be a thing, and you know, I would still encourage everyone to be involved and doing the right things to try and lower their carbon footprint and their, uh, the damage they're doing in the environment, mostly this isn't down to us. We are not going to solve this. This is being done to us. And it's being done to all life on Earth. So we sort of know all that now. And the first really important point that I want to make in this video is that we all individually need to accept that we have lost this fight. Um, this is no longer going to be, um, if we rise up and we convince governments to change policy and if we annex those companies or boycott their products for long enough, then we can reverse this and we can fix the problem. The problem has been compounded over a long period of time. Now, I'm not a climate scientist, but I've always had clients who are. I've spent a lot of my life around climate scientists of different types and activists, um, and I've always had a huge personal interest in this. Um, and it, what's become very clear if you if you actually spend time in academic circles and in the circles of scientists who have who are dealing with this on a daily basis, uh, the changes within a biome within a climate system are very long term. And the damage was done a long time ago, and it's continuing to be done, and it's accelerating. So it's not that if we managed to turn the tap off now, everything would get better. We would still have to deal with decades uh, or longer of damage. Um, but we are not turning this around. Like, things are not getting better. They are getting worse every year. Uh, more pollution is being produced. Uh, uh, more CO2 is being dumped into the atmosphere. There is some good to, to kind of take away from things. Um, if you watch the channel called Kurzgesagt, I'll put a link in the description. Um, I love the, the kind of science videos that they do, and they recently did one on optimism around climate change, and how actually a lot of technologies are, are maturing, and uh, a lot of CO2 production and things like that are being curbed in some areas, but a lot of it comes down to obfuscation, uh, carbon offsetting and, and gimmicks like that, which actually don't have any real-world impact. They're just ways that uh, corporations can, can wriggle out of, of being prosecuted and, and being held to account. So I think that it's essential that on a personal level we accept that we've lost this battle, that huge damage has been done, is being done, and we will see the impact of that damage in the decades to come. Um, more extreme weather, uh, shifts in climate patterns, um, all sorts of secondary effects, and then of course the huge social effects. As uh, water ceases to be available in some parts of the world, you'll get mass migration. As resources begin to become variously not as available, or pollution begins to damage certain areas of the world, or sea level rise means that we can't grow food in some areas, you will get wars, you will get conflicts, you will get global tensions of the likes of which we haven't really seen in our lifetimes. So this is huge, and I'm sorry to say that we have to accept that it's now inevitable. It's simply going to happen. There's nothing that you or I can do, even if you watching this happen to be a policymaker or a vastly wealthy or well-connected person or a climate scientist. We know there's not really anything we can do now. This is not any longer about how can we stop the damage? How can we save the world? Uh, the rhetoric of saving the world was left behind a long time ago. That isn't what we're here to do anymore. That isn't what this is about anymore. This is about something else. So um, that's enormous. I mean, that, that is a huge hammer blow to the psyche. We, uh, we're animals, primarily. We're mammals. And mammals have uh, a physiological mechanism to respond to threat. Um, and we kind of refer to it as the fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, but it's designed for immediate threats. It's designed for there is an immediate threat to my survival and my safety. Um, adrenaline kicks in, various other hormones um, and neurological responses happen. Um, so things happen with muscle tension and breathing patterns. And our whole body is designed, or at least has evolved, to do this, to respond to threat in a certain way. Doesn't really work with longitudinal threats. It doesn't work with threats that are a long time in the future, that are quite abstract, and which are so existential. We are looking in our lifetimes at the deaths of millions, perhaps billions of people, at the eradication of ecosystems and biomes. We're looking at tremendous damage around the world, and um, 
and all of the social and and um, uh, you know political and personal impacts that that will have on us, the suffering that we will witness in our lifetimes and perhaps experience in our lifetimes, that's huge. And it affects everybody. It affects me. Um, I feel, whew, I feel afraid. I feel furious that this has been allowed to happen and that it's continuing. And um, just the way that our civilization works means there's not really much that I or apparently anyone can or is willing to do about this. I feel a sense of despair. I feel overwhelmed by the reality of this. My neurological and physiological responses were designed to help me respond to a threat, solve that, that problem and then move on. I can't solve this. You can't solve this. We can't solve this. This is not going to be fixed. We are going to go through this together. Um, we are going to experience terrible hardship. Our children will have it worse. Um, and we will watch on the news as suffering happens around the world. Of course, those who are most vulnerable, uh, those who have the least power, will suffer the most. Um, and it is our civilization's ability to um, have these profound imbalances in social justice, which will just compound the suffering, like terribly. So as I think about that, and I'm sure as you think about that, it's really hard to to even function, to even to even carry on. Um, there's a real trend in um, certainly millennials and Gen Z of just, what's the point? Popular entertainment is do dominated by apocalyptic, uh, uh, you know, books and movies and shows. And there's a big thread of, what's the point? We're all gonna die or we're going to witness terrible death, or we're going to witness terrible suffering. And that is what we've been handed by our parents, by their parents, by this civilization. I don't think it's reasonable to blame our parents because they weren't usually conscious of what they were doing. They were usually responding to a different existential threat, which was, um, you know, nuclear war or cold wars. Uh, and, and before that, hot wars. Um, and they responded to those, I guess, in the best way that they knew how. But indirectly and unintentionally, they were contributing to the situation we find ourselves in now. So there is a growing sense of kind of despair and overwhelm. Our minds and our bodies were not evolved, created. They don't function in a way that gives us any real way of being able to access and tackle and operationalize and take action and prepare for this. Um, there are three basic responses that people in our culture have to this situation. The first one is um, avoidance and uh, I guess denial. So this is anything that um, you, others around you do in order to make sure that um, you don't really think about this or that it isn't actually a problem. Uh, so this is everything from um, Scrolling and other numbing techniques, uh, things that will mean that you don't really have to think about this, uh, focusing on today, focusing on your career, focusing on your relationship, all the other things that are hugely important, but make sure that you have no mental capacity left to think about this. Um, and that goes right through to those climate change deniers who just decide that this isn't really a thing and it's a conspiracy or something. Um, so that's, that's one response that we collectively have. And like the other two responses I'm going to come on to, this doesn't actually deal with the problem. This doesn't in any way either tackle climate change or prepare me for the ensuing problems it's going to create in my life, the way it's going to affect me. It doesn't help with any of that. There is no action as a result of avoidance or denial. Um, because what we're doing without the mental and physiological faculties to tackle a long-term threat like this, what we're doing is we're just trying to deal with the immediate effect. We're trying to deal with the feelings that we have, the fear, the anger, the overwhelm. How do we make that go away? Well, one way is to avoid or deny the topic. So that's the first way that people often do this. And then the second way that people respond to this threat is what I would call arbitrary hope. Um, so this is hope that paralyzes, just like uh, avoidance and denial paralyzes us from actually engaging with this in a meaningful, practical way. Arbitrary hope does the same thing. It just makes everything 
okay and it deals with the emotional impact of it. So uh, this might be the idea that technology will save us or billionaires will save us or um, the program to colonize Mars will save us or um, maybe the climate scientists have just got their modeling wrong. Uh, maybe maybe they're very intelligent people, but they've just made some mistakes. There's some, some problems in their maths. They don't really know. I mean, this is all modeling and modeling's been shown to be wrong in the past. Um, so, so it's just this sort of decision that this is gonna be okay. Actually, it's all gonna work out. Um, and just like avoidance and denial, it is um, a way that we deal with the emotional impact, uh, but we paralyze ourselves from any meaningful, practical um, response. And then the third one that people respond, they're the third entirely natural and, and, and often repeated response is simply overwhelm and collapse. Um, we look at this and we begin to feel what it's like, not just to think about the suffering that's coming, whether it's to other people or to ourselves, whether it's um, a sort of a loathing for our species and all the damage that we're doing to a world that we have an instinctive love for. Um, or, um, you know, whether it's beginning to look at the species that have already been lost and the ones that will be lost and just all these layers of grief and sadness and overwhelm and, and rage and anger and frustration. Um, it's very normal to also simply be paralyzed by that, to be overwhelmed to the point of collapse. Um, and I have known so many people who just hit this roadblock with this topic and that was it. That was, they had nowhere else to go. Um, uh, some of them sadly are no longer with us uh, and others simply collapse into themselves um, and they can be emotionally paralyzed um, for a while. You know, it can last a while. Um, often they will then go and find either you know, some form of avoidance or denial um, in order to just find a way of functioning. Because again, we don't have the mental or physiological faculties to, to tackle with this. So we do one of these three things. We just try to deal with the emotional impact of it by avoiding and denying, finding some form of arbitrary hope to cling on to, or uh, collapsing and being, being unmade by the, by the scale of the threat. So those are the three things that I see in people regularly. Um, and almost everyone I know is having one of those responses. So what do we do? What can we do that's different to those three things? When I think about everything that I know about how the human person functions, um, so how our bodies work, how our minds work, how our emotions work, all the stuff that I talk about on this channel I try and unpack, all the stuff that I try to make available and practicable to my clients. If I think about all of that and then I think about, all right, well, let's deal with the reality. The reality that we've lost this battle that the damage is coming and that we need to prepare in some way. Uh, we need to begin to take action, um, both to protect ourselves and to protect those who are closest to us and to, as much as we can, individually and collectively minimize the damage. So what can we do that frees us up, that actually makes us committed to action, which stops us being paralyzed by the overwhelm of the emotion, by uh, arbitrary hope that puts the balance of, of action onto somebody else. Uh, the Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos is gonna save us from this. Um, the president of the US is gonna save us from this. How do we take power back into ourselves and be freed up from our physiological paralysis? This is what I have. I call it defiance. If you think about human history, if you take your mind back to history class, we often think about the kings and the queens and the inventors and the warriors, um, those who made the world what it is. But for every one of those, there were hundreds of thousands of ordinary people who simply had to live through the consequences of the choices of those in power. So in that sense, this isn't kind of new. It's the scale of the threat is new and the level of awareness that we have is new and we're used to having control, we're used to having agency, we're used to being able to do something and this time we're not. So we need to call back on something that we've used in the past. If you were a farmer in the Middle Ages and uh, there was a drought or a famine or a plague, uh, you had to carry on working your fields. You had to carry on functioning. You had to feed your children. It was not a question. It wasn't a thing you could go, oh, well, this is all too much and I can't function anymore. You had to engage some kind of emotional response. 
And I would call that response defiance. It's shouting into a storm. It is saying, I will not go quietly into the night without a fight. It's saying that this is mad. We've lost. People are going to die. This is, this is nonsense. I, am, I feel this tremendous emotional burden. And yet, I will continue to act. I will defy this. I will fight back against this. I will scream in the face of this and I am going to do what needs to be done to feed the children, to protect myself and to protect those I care about, to turn the course of this ship even just a few degrees, to get involved in activism, to to fight back in every little way that I can with my tiny shred of power, with my tiny little bit of agency. I will take action. It's crazy. It's not logical. Uh, you know, there is so much about civilization which tells us to trust that things will be okay. It is the function of civilization to keep us okay. So as citizens, our job is to trust that everything will be okay, that we will be provided for, that safety will come from somewhere. But it won't. And so we as individuals have to come back to our own power and our own agency and say, I admit that we have lost. I admit that suffering is coming. I admit that there is nothing that I can do to make all of this go away. I am exposed in the face of this existential, terrifying situation. And I defy my instinct to paralyze. I defy all the things, all the agencies of power in the world that just want us to be be meek and quiet and to simply trust that things will work out. Because they won't. So defiance means fighting back. Defiance means taking as much action as is possible now. But before I get into what do we do, this video is really about how do we emotionally respond. And defiance is an emotional response. It is the way that we choose to say, I will not go quietly. I won't just allow this to happen. I'm going to find things I can do every day. I'm going to try and find ways that I can prepare, ways that I can bring this up in conversation, ways that I can uh, affect the way that people vote so that at least some sanity is enforced before, you know, everything spirals into some kind of awful situation, you know, the worst that it could possibly be. So we fight back and I call this response defiance simply because it's bad. We can't know that things are going to work out. In fact, we know they won't. We can't know that we will personally be safe because there's no guarantee of that. There's no way to know where this will go or how it will end up. So defiance is to say, in the face of this huge threat and in, 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 you know, with no rational basis to know that I will be okay at the far side, like our ancestors who didn't know how things were going to work out but had to continue anyway, like People who are engaged in wars and they are, you know, they need to go into a situation and fulfill a mission. They have no idea whether they will survive, whether the mission will be completed, but they continue to act anyway. In the face of this enormous threat and all of the instincts that we have and all of the impulses of civilization that are just telling us to trust that everything will be okay, go back on our phones and scroll, defiance means I will not do that. I will not lose myself to numbing, to avoidance or denial. I will not lose myself to arbitrary hope. It, you know, I'm not going to hope that some millionaire is going to invent something that will save us all, that carbon capture will come along and this whole problem will go away. And it says that I will develop the faculties so that I will not collapse in the face of this. Defiance is my response. And I offer it to you as a thing to consider. This is all pretty new. I'm not, I don't now have an enormous training package put together to help you develop your response, your experience of defiance, but I'll work on it. If that would be useful, I'll work on it. I'll come up with something that will make this more accessible, more actionable, more helpful. But for today, I just want to say, consider your response as one of defiance. And if we can move through this and get to some point where we actually can begin to take action, where we aren't paralyzed by our physiological and emotional responses, what do we do? I'll offer a few ideas. Um, There are people who know vastly more about this than I am. So once you're on the other side of this and you have embraced defiance and you are are madly committed to taking as much action as you can, then please go looking. There is so much information out there. 
but um, you know certain things, um, practical resilience, so do you know where your food's going to come from, do you know your neighbours, do you have a sense of community around you, and if you don't have those things can you skill up, uh, develop relationships, um, find ways of being able to foster uh, resilience within your local area. Um, there is uh, getting involved in political activism and political movements, um, things like Extinction Rebellion, things that will try to institute some form of sanity in our political decisions, our economics, um, our lawmaking, all these sorts of things, making sure that this isn't just pure insanity. Uh, it's building a support network, so it's working out who supports you, who is there for you, who can you call up just to say, you know, it's overwhelming again and I just want to be able to talk this through, someone who won't try to solve everything for you because there is no solution, but someone who will listen, someone who cares, someone who will see you and see what you're going through and you know who you can you know that they're in it with you um that's a support network can you build or increase the resilience of your support network and then i suppose the other major thing is emotional resilience and i certainly will return to that on this channel how can we become increasingly emotionally strong so that we are not unmade by this thing as it happens to us um, how can we look at this and feel everything feel the fear and the rage and the despair, and the frustration, and the, the grief. How can we feel those things truly, acknowledge them, allow ourselves to process those things, and yet remain active, remain strong, remain whole, remain healthy? So I will certainly return to that topic. Um, and then I will take this in whatever direction seems useful for you. So please do give me feedback, leave a comment on this video, um, drop me an email, you know, talk to me in a coaching session, whatever is helpful. Just let me know what do you want to unpack and figure out in your response to climate change. That's the video for today. Uh, there will be videos that I produce which are, here's a problem for us in our practical modern lives and here's a solution or here's an idea or here's a process or here's a step-by-step -step thing you can follow through. Again, this is not always going to be like that and this video particularly was an examination. What happens to us when we are confronted with the reality that we're facing? What are the responses that we tend to have? What do I think is a new response, a way through this, something that makes us more resilient, makes us able to take action, and then what can you begin to do? I will develop these videos based on your feedback uh, and what you think is most useful to hear from me. Until next time, take care of yourself. Um, I would love to hear how you respond to this topic, so please uh, leave a comment. Um, it helps the channel if you like and subscribe, so that would be great as well. Um, otherwise, until next time, take care of yourself. Bye-bye.